The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He awakeneth me morning by morning, he awakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Welcome to Power Principles. I'm your host, Dr. Van Gaten, and uh, we are just so excited about you being with us today. Before I begin today, I'd like to start by thanking Bishop Stan Williams uh, of Jacksonville, Florida, the Church 320, and uh, the, also the president of the Williams Bible Institute and Seminary, of which I am the academic dean. Uh, and I did my doctorate work at Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, Florida, and wrote my dissertation on the good news for racism, a dialogue that makes a difference. So as we begin the lesson today in this Advent season, um, I, I would like to bring to your attention that uh, it's very important that we're going to be having a lot, you know, we talk about the gospel. That's what I'm talking about today. The gospel is the power of God. That's one, si one aspect of power. It's the dunamis to theu. So the, the power of God. But also we said that we believe in preaching an Afrocentric hermeneutic because that's who we are and where we live and our personal experience to which the rest of America cannot understand because we are the ones who experientially went through it. And in this season, I think it's real important uh, that we recognize that one of, the, one of the aspects of this Afrocentric hermeneutic is uh, pictures. You see all the pictures at Christmas time, you see all of them and you know, and most of all, it's usually a white Jesus on the wall, white angels, white manger, and white Jesus in a, in a manger, and Mary and Joseph are white. And, and, and believe me, I, I, this is not anti-white message, but what I'm saying is we see nothing reflected in Christianity that looks like us, even though uh, Adam uh, is considered to be the first man on earth and that he was what? Put in the Garden of Eden. Both of those are believed to have been in Africa. And anything born in Africa looks like an African, even if it's Hebrew, it's African. So we need uh, to make sure that the Bibles we buy, all the pictures, especially for our children, we need to make sure that the gospel we preach, see, we are created, we are the imago Dei. We're the imagers of God. And God wants us to reflect his image in us being of African descent. So it is totally acceptable and should be something that we have a deep conviction about. And that is we need to put pictures up that reflect Christianity historically that look like us. And so I want to encourage you in your buying your Bibles. Uh, you can buy Bibles that have pictures of, that look like African Africans in them, that Jesus looks like he's from Africa, Adam's from Africa, the angels are dark skin. If you go back to the Byzantine era uh, and travel those countries which I have, even their icons are all uh, dark brown to black because they accepted it, because there wasn't a color problem in history at that time. It's only in America and in Europe when the, the term white was invented, 1681, I believe, as a result of the what? The Bacon Rebellion, that all of a sudden the terms black and white, and that become an issue, especially for the black man considered to be a slave, uh, dehumanized, less than. And so at this Christmas season, wh what is the good news for us? It's the God who made us, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he ref made us to reflect his image. We also, we along with everybody else, I don't care what nationality, what ethnicity, we all look like God. And so it's only fair that having come out of a racist society that we don't want images up. Like Frederick Douglass said, uh, my commitment is to the Christ of Scripture, not the Christ of white America. Now, white America, black America, brown America, Asian America, Latino, we all were made by the same God. He loves us all. We're out of one blood, Acts 17 said. He made all nations. And yet, 
we recognize that we live in a fallen world. And that fallen world and that fallen human nature, the depravity of man, from the Latin word de, meaning very, prevos, crooked. From the fallen humanity, we, we are, are, we've gained this propensity to exalt ourselves. We must put others down. This ethnocentrism where one ethnicity thinks it's the center and better than all other ethnicities. And in our history in America, born out of slavery, we know that white America has always felt that we are less than them. And yet, that is not true. We are equal. So we want to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters during this season because of Christ, but it's reconciliation among equals. And we don't even want a hermeneutical imperialism. We don't think that just European Americans have the final say about what is truth. We believe, as African Americans, we can discover the truth as well. Chinese as well. All of us, called of God, filled with the Spirit, given a mind, we do the research, we do the time, we get the degrees, we can arrive at truth as well. It doesn't have to just be white America. It can be all America, and especially those who have gone through. But also, <clears throat> our show is about being Pentecostal, that a lot of people think that we're the persona non gratis, and that's because they think we put experience above Scripture. Well, some of us do. It's true. It's happened. I've seen it myself. But they're also, for the evangelicals, I find out that we put reason above Scripture. I attended a Presbyterian evangelical seminary to do my doctorate work. And so I know firsthand that you can put reason above Scripture, just like Pentecostal can put experience above Scripture. And we don't want to be guilty of either. We don't want to be guilty of either. And so in the gospel message, uh, I started out by saying, you know, that it is the power of God and that it breaks down into creation, the fall, redemption, consummation. Those are the four main aspects of the gospel. And we began with the garden. Bereshit uh, Elohim bara the shahamin aretz. He created the heavens and the earth. God did this. But before Genesis 1, that beginning, we need to know from Scripture, and we don't have time today, but let me just put this seed of thought into your minds, that there were two beginnings. There was the beginning, and that was jo uh, Job 38, when the sons of God, they were created before we were on earth. So we had two beginnings, the beginning of the invisible world and the beginning of the visible world. And there were two, two, two divine councils, the divine council in heaven and the divine council on earth. And so today that brings us to the Garden of Eden. And that's where we're going to pick up in just a few minutes. But again, uh, if you're struggling with this concept thought, you'll find verses like uh, Psalm 82. Uh, says God has taken his place in the divine council. And that is where, and then we know that the Garden of Eden was the divine council because that wasn't just any garden. That was the garden that God himself lived in. In fact, when Adam was kicked out of that garden, God put a cherubim angel to guard the way so man couldn't come back because that was a sacred space. The throne room of God is a sacred space in heaven. The Garden of Eden initially was a sacred space on earth in the tabernacle of Moses amongst the children of Israel. That was a sacred space, and we're used to that. You go to church on Sunday, and you enter into a sacred space. We used to teach our children, behave yourself in the house of God. Don't run up on the pulpit. Don't go, because that's where the man of God, the woman of God is. That's where the sacred, the whole sanctuary is sacred because that's where we visit with God. It's from there we congregate. The ecclesia comes together. Qual Yahweh, the assembly of God, comes together to experience God. This is the place where heaven touches earth, the altar place of God. And so this is very important for us to see that God always establishes a sacred space. God has two councils from which he rules over the one in heaven. He is ruling over the one on earth. 
expressed through the church, and we need to be working heaven as it is in heaven, so it ought to be on earth. And so the two must work together, and that's what we're after. But there are so many things that are in the book of Genesis that, that, that just tells us we need to spend a lot more time in this book and to make sure we understand the beginning, because that has a lot to do with the ending. For instance, the Bible begins in Genesis 3 with the Garden of Eden being established. And when you read Revelations 21 and 22 in the end, you see that whole Garden of Eden experience or metaphor being brought forth because God is restoring through his second Adam what the first Adam forfeited by disobedience. So God is trying to still make paradise restored. The, the creation starts to decreate and then recreate as what God is doing, the universe as well as mankind. And so I think this is very important for us in this season, in this time, that we really make sure that we recognize where we are and what we should be doing, abiding in God. And I think this is critical, this is sine qua non, essential for us to buy into, invest in, participate, hook up with Jesus and begin this journey with God as he establishes his opus day, his work in the earth for us to do. So we're going to take a break right now, and uh, I'm going to come back to you, and we're going to continue this discussion. I hope it's been a blessing to you, but we'll see you in just a few minutes. God bless you. Have you ever wondered if there were a place where you could learn God's word on a college level? where the tuition is purposely kept low so no one is left out, a place where the professors are committed to your growth and education. At the Williams Bible Institute, we are working to make sure that place is us. We are a fully accredited Bible college. You can apply or register by calling 904-779-0101. Have you ever felt like God wants you to know more than the surface of the Bible? But you've thought to yourself that you just don't have the time to go sit in a traditional Bible college to learn and grow. Well, the Williams Bible Institute and Seminary is here to help. You can now learn from our highly esteemed teaching staff completely online. So teaching-wise, I've been able to give uh, lectures at Harvard Divinity School. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've done symposiums at uh, UCLA and and at Princeton mm -hmm. and Union Theological Seminary in oh, New York yes, City. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, and then look, I've taught in Gordon Conwell, Conwell Theological Bill. Seminary. Yes. I've introduced even new courses to them right. uh, there. Awesome. And uh, I've taught in community colleges, also the University of Buffalo. I was an adjunct professor there, and I taught the African-American religious experience. Yes, yes which and, I love that. Yes, and I teach apologetics, how to give an intellectual defense of the gospel right. to unbelievers that have questions. There is a way to gain deeper knowledge of God's Word, but also maintain your busy schedule. The Women's Bible Institute Distant Education was created just for busy moms with little ones businessmen and women with a hectic schedule, even college students who just want to pair their secular degree with the Word of God. We are now offering online classes to fit into your busy schedule. Or online. Online is the biggest one because we can reach further. Uh, uh, and those of you that maybe you can't get out, but you can do it while you're home at your own time, on your own time, and get a fully accredited uh, 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 diploma uh, for the first year. Now we got the diploma for the first year yes. uh, on um, uh, Biblical Foundation diploma for the first year. Yes. And then the second year we're doing a fully associates. A full associates. Full associates. Yes. And then the third year we're going to uh, go to the bachelor's. We're going to go to the bachelor's. And then, and then the, the, bachelor, uh, the master's. The master's. And then of course the doctorate. And then the doctorate with dissertation. With dissertation. <laughs> All right. You can register today for your Biblical Foundations diploma without making a major change to your daily life. A good biblical foundation, everybody needs it. And maybe you never had the opportunity to do it because you were either too busy and uh, you didn't have the kind of time 
Uh, we've kept the tuition so low that people are wondering how in the world are we doing it. We're doing it by faith. But uh, most importantly, I want you to become a part of, of Williams Bible Institute and Seminary. And you can go and register for the online courses right now. Register and apply today at TWBIS.org. again and welcome back to the show Power of Principles and I'm your host Dr. Van Gayton, Jacksonville, Florida and uh, as I was talking to you about uh, the hermeneutics and the Afrocentric hermeneutic I also wanted to mention to you that one of the power principles we have for the show is that we believe in the supernatural there's just no way around that I want to call it straight up the supernatural and this is essential to our understanding that it all the supernatural acts of God there's the natural there's the supernatural there's the physical there's the metaphysical and when one opens the Word of God to become born again is a supernatural experience but we need to recognize that I know many of my brothers and sisters are not big on talking a lot about the supernatural but even during this season, the fact that a virgin girl, and I know that in the Mesoretic text from which King James and other versions are taken, it says from Isaiah 7:14, I believe, that it was a young maiden. But if you go back to the Septuagint, you'll find that it uses the word in the Greek that means virgin, virgin, just like the text originally called out. It was a virgin girl. But for a virgin... To birth the Son of God is a supernatural act that God became a man. Supernatural act. The incarnation. Supernatural act that God created Adam and then put a deep sleep as an androgynous being, a hermaphrodite. All of a sudden, he's put into a deep sleep and Eve is taken from his side and Whoa, we have woman. In fact, when Adam saw Eve, he said, Ish-ah, the woman. The word Ish-ah in Hebrew means woman. And I think every time a man sees a woman, he goes, Ish-ah. Why? Because that's the attraction that God has put into the picture. But the fact that Eve came forth from Adam, a supernatural act. Angels singing at the announcement of our Lord coming. Supernatural act. I mean, when God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says in Job 38 that the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, they rejoice. Why? Because God spoke ex nihilo, uh, something out of nothing. Supernatural act. And I think of how I came to know the Lord at a softball game at the age of of, of 21 years old uh, that, that God touched me by his spirit and spoke to me by his word and that was over 40 years ago. That's a supernatural act of almighty God. I was strung out on drugs. I was broke, busted, and disgusted, toe up from the flow up, not knowing where I was going to go. But look what the Lord has done in my life and yours today. And so if you're serving God and you are a part of the generation that we came out of slavery, the African Americans, then we understand the phrase, God can make a way out of no way. And that's what I want us to understand today, that because God is a supernatural God, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. There's no circumstances. There's nothing we face. If he can do all that he's done, as I ran through, and the Bible says we're called to study the very works of God, the very opus day, the works of God. We need to study them to have the faith, the trust, the confidence to believe God that God will make a way out of no way for us personally, for in this nation at this time, that if God is reconciling the world unto himself and at a time when our nation is divided by the race issues, if ever the church needed to come together, the black church, we have to come together because when we think of our communities and, and what our people are going through, the, 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 church, the black church has always been the home base, the focal point, 
uh, 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 for the community, for its survival. And so we need God to empower us to look out amongst our own and find out what gospel we do we need to bring to them. How can we serve them? How can every local church, there shouldn't be a thing where a local church can be in a neighborhood and if it moves on, nobody even knows that it was there because the church doesn't just operate on Sunday. The church is 24-7, 365. God put us in the community to rescue the community. And then he put us in the community because he wants us to be the bulwark the bellwether for reaching out to the rest of society to deal with the social injustices that we face in this nation and that our people go through every day, and yet we need a voice, and the church should be that voice that speaks up, that we not only preach on Sunday from the pulpit, but we can stand in City Hall, and we can stand in the bank system, and we can speak truth to power under the anointing of God, we need modern day Moses as you were, as it will, just to say, let my people go. That's the backdrop. And I think for the white church to recognize what we're going through and to be complicit, I think it's important that the white and black church stand together, unified, to stand against the powers of darkness and the ills of society that render so many of us uh, to be suffering from social injustice. And I think that one of the unities of the black church and white church coming together is that the white church of America must understand that unless you recognize the social injustices that we have always faced from slavery to Jim Crow to sharecroppers to civil rights, I mean, everything we've been through in this nation, we didn't even get our 40 acres and the mule that was, that was promised to us by the government. Uh, we didn't get that. So reparation was part of the deal. We didn't get that. And yet, unless we need more than just a handful of abolitionists, we need the white church to say to the black church, listen, if we have to bear the pain of what our people have been through, then white America has to blame, bear the shame. You need to know that it's okay to be ashamed of your forefathers, of your grandparents, of your aunts and your uncles who had the nerve to speak of us in a derogatory and treat us in a derogatory way. We have to every day live with the pain. So let's bear the burden together. You bear the shame, we bear the pain, but we both are bearing something. And if we come together, stand unified, then we can see the power of God demonstrated in this nation as never before. We can be like the Apostle Paul, who although he was Jewish, he still reached out to the Gentiles. And every day, as a result of that sits in Lebanon, he was either riot or revival everywhere this little Jewish man went. And by the way, you don't have to know karate. You don't have to be an expert. I mean, Flavius Josephus tells us that the Apostle Paul was only about five foot two, 120 pounds, crook nose, hunchback, receding hairline, but he was a powerful brother. I mean, I visited the Roman prison that he sat in, so they say, uh, in Rome. And I saw what he was willing to go through because he thought there should be, according to the book of Ephesians, that God is raising up a new man in Christ. And until we stop making excuses, until we come down, see the, the black church has to be delivered from feeling inferior and the white church has to be delivered from feeling superior. We are leveled at the cross, but a little different from Jonathan Edwards, preachers, sinners in it hands of an angry God, this, this Puritan, this theologian, this intellectual thinker, he said, oh yes, I believe we should all come to the foot of the cross, but he said, I don't think I'm going to be in heaven with anybody black. And guess what, Jonathan? I'm going to sit right next to you if the Lord lets me. I'm going to sit right next to you, my brother, my brother. Sit right next to you and sing the songs of, re of the redeemed, the redeemed. And so, it's going to be an arduous journey for us. Uh, there's going to have, that's why we need the power of God so we can be witnesses or martyrs because you can't be an effective witness and not lose your life for his namesake. Jesus said, he who loses his life gains it, and he who seeks to gain it will lose it. We need to let it go for Jesus' sake as he let his go for our sake. 
Martin Luther King Jr. gave his life in this nation. And there should be brothers and sisters who will go to the same end that out of love, out of loving all humanity, we will boldly declare what thus saith the Lord to all powers because God is here for us. So if this season is going to be meaning for us and more than just handing out gifts, then I want a black Jesus on the wall. <laughs> I want a black Last Supper scene in front of me. Why? Because I'm an African American and I think I should have that just as much as one brother said, why do you have those black pictures up on your wall? My question back, why do you have white pictures on your wall? Listen, they're both okay, but let each one have what they will. And it's time for us to have what we will for the glory and honor of God. But we need to work through this dialogue. We need to have a redemptive dialogue. These are issues that need to be talked about in the black community. We need to come together as never before because that's a, that's a necessity that we be unified. We got to help our brothers and sisters get off the streets, killing each other, shooting each other, robbing each other. We've got to stop that, attacking old people, young guys attacking old ladies to get their checks. We got to have dignity and respect for ourselves. We got to deal with the enemy within before we can deal with the enemy without. Let us love ourselves. Let us love each other as it ought to be. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, let this message penetrate every heart that is listening and let each one receive a conviction and a calling from you and let all the wounds the hurts the scars the existential absurdity that we have gone through be delivered from it in the name of Jesus we thank you for your coming into this world and giving your life for us we'll see you next week God bless you have you ever wondered if there were a place where you could learn God's Word on a college level where the tuition is purposely kept low so no one is left out. A place where the professors are committed to your growth and education. At the Williams Bible Institute, we are working to make sure that place is us. We are a fully accredited Bible college. You can apply or register by calling 904-779-0101. Praise the Lord and God bless you. This is Bishop Stan Williams, one of God's prophets. Listen, God spoke to me prophetically several years ago about how Christian education will return to the local church. And watching the move of God over these last several years, we have launched our Williams Bible Institute online college. Now listen, for those of you that believe that God has spoke to you about your ministry, about the call of God on your life, we have created an online school just for you. Now, I only have 300 seats available right now with this special offer. If you would register, the cost is only $875 compared to our regular $2,000 a year. This is a biblical diploma. You can do it a year or less, but I need you to go right now to register at TWBIUSA.org. If you will register today as soon as possible so you can lock your seat in, there's only 300 seats available. It's gonna be an amazing experience and I believe that God's gonna do something great and special in your life in this season, a season of doing ministry at the next level.